one of the most notable things about Christians is our love for and trust in the Bible. In fact, it's very common that when we're gathered together here, I, I, I kind of give a shout out to anyone who's visiting uh, here who uh, is not, not a believer. Maybe you, just, you don't profess faith in Jesus. Maybe someone who's listening online or hears this on the radio and just, I don't believe in Jesus, but I'm curious what these Christians think. It is hard to miss the fact that we love and trust the Bible. We have a verse for everything, and if we find out that we're doing something we don't have a verse for, we stop doing that thing or try to correct course or look again because we truly love the Bible. Last week, I looked through a few verses in Hebrews chapter 4 into chapter 5 and looked at Hebrews chapter 4, 12. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And I argued that that's talking about the Bible, the message of the gospel, the truth delivered to us in words that we have in our Bible today. One of my favorite things about the book of Hebrews, which we're in right now as a church studying through, is that the author does not say, take a risk on Jesus. The author does not say, just set down your Bibles for a second and just blindly seek out this new way as distinct from the old way, the new way being Jesus. But over and over and over again, the author holds out the Bible. He holds out the Old Testament, what his audience would have had access to. And he says, don't trust me. Look, look. And he points back again and again and again. His appeal over and over, is to the Word of God. It's one of the things that I love about this book. The primary point of our passage today is to show us that Jesus exceeds the requirements for a high priest and that he is the only source for our salvation. I'm going to spend our our morning showing you that, but the author, you'll notice, does not merely claim it, but proves it from the Bible and shows that it was always to be that way. I'm going to go ahead and read through our passage this morning. I invite you to follow along with me. We're in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. We're repeating a bit of what we covered last week to, to make sure we didn't miss anything. And then I'm going to go ahead and go back through after we pray a verse or so at a time, as we usually do. Let's, let's, let's read this and then pray together. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Let's pray. Lord, our hope this morning is that we make much of you. Father, help us to lift up your holy name, to think rightly about your son. Lord, we never can aim too high in our view of who you are, of who your son is. So Lord, help us to lift our gaze appropriately, to see you where you really are in full perfection and and truth. Lord, help us to see you clearly that we may love you more. Lord, help the greatest application of texts like this to be love 
and knowledge of you more than we had before we started reading. Lord, help, help those things guide us in our life to be the things that mark who we are in our lives, that we would know and trust you more. Lord, use your word to do exactly what it's designed to do, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Every high priest chosen. A quick recap, we started this a little bit last week, but in order to make sense of these verses, we need to have an understanding of what the Old Testament, this was built upon, tells us about priests. So last week I did a much more thorough version of that, but just as a summary, I showed from the Old Testament that God gave the people priests to mediate between him and his people. You may remember that there were 12 tribes of Israel, that is, 12 sons of the man whose name was Israel. And each of those sons was the leader of a a subsequent tribe that would come down the line of history. And one of those sons' name was Levi, and he was chosen by God and his tribe, those who would follow after him, to perform all the religious duties required for worship. Moses of the Exodus fame, and his brother Aaron. They were from the tribe of Levi. They were descendants from Levi, the son of Israel. And God gave Aaron specifically, of the tribe of Levi, selected Aaron and his descendants to have the special duty and responsibility of priest. So there were Levites, and then there were priests. And no one other than Aaron... And his descendants could be called priests. I'm going to show you real quick, just a quick, quick summary verse in the Old Testament. This is from Numbers 18, verses 1 through 3. It's written by Moses. This is telling us about this period of time where God establishes the system of worship and gives priests to the people. He says this, So the Lord said to Aaron, You and your sons and your father's house with you shall bear iniquity connected with the sanctuary, and you and your sons with you shall bear iniquity connected with your priesthood. So the responsibility and role of of Aaron and his descendants would be that they would bear iniquity, sins connected with their priesthood. And with you bring your brothers also, the tribe of Levi, the tribe of your father, that they may join you and minister to you while you and your sons with you are before the tent of the testimony. So so quick pause. What's being instructed to Aaron is, Aaron, you and your sons shall join with your brothers and the the household of your father, Levi, in in the line of Levi. You together shall minister before the tent of the testimony. Okay? They, the Levites, shall keep guard over you and over the whole tent, but shall not come near to the vessels of the sanctuary or to the altar, lest they and you die. Okay, there's a whole bunch of verses like this in the Old Testament. But this is kind of a summary, and it's saying, Levi, the house of Levi, will be those in charge of ministering. Last week, I showed a little bit more that the Levites were told specifically, the non-Aaron line, but just just the rest of the Levites, were told that they were supposed to take charge of the parts of the tent. Some of them had the frame. They literally had to put the whole, literally the frame of the the portable temple, temple, the tabernacle in the wilderness. They carried that around and set it up and made sure it was always maintained. Others of the tribe of Levi were designated to take care of the fabric, like the tent material that would actually go on those frames, and they had to maintain those things. Others were given the particular task of taking care of the vessels and and, and the, the furnishings inside the tent of meeting and inside the tabernacle. They would set those up, care for them, maintain them, but once set up, they were to step back. Because it was only Aaron and his sons that could come near to the vessels of the sanctuary or to the altar, lest they, the rest of the Levites, and you, for permitting them, would die. So there's Levites, who were not priests, and Aaron and his line, who were priests. 
The priests are often referred to as Levitical priests throughout the Old Testament because they're in the line of Levi. But it's not saying that all the Levites were priests. The Aaronites were priests. But the Levites was the first qualification. And every time that priests and Levites are talked about in the Old Testament, they are distinguished from, an, from one another. So all over, if you were to look up priests and Levites and how they're talked about, you, hear, you see things like this. The priests and the Levites did things together. The priests and the Levites. The priests would do the priestly duties. The Levites would minister in other ways. Furthermore, of the Levites, from the line of Aaron, the priests, one was selected to be the high priest who would offer the sin sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. Once a year, he would pass through the veil in the temple into the most holy place, and only on that one day was he permitted to do so in a ceremonial fashion in order to present the sin sacrifice that would atone for the people. He would stand before the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the throne of God in the midst of his people, and he would offer sacrifice there. Now, this priesthood... These priests were a necessary component for a right relationship between people and God. And he continues on to say this, He can deal, he, the high priest, can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. So here again, the author of Hebrews is telling us about just about Aaron specifically, picture a high priest in the Old Testament. He can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. The idea here is that the high priest was a sinner, just like us. In fact, him being a sinner, him being beset with weakness, is the grounds for his gentleness. Why is it that he, without much attention given to it, may be gentle with the people? Well, because he knows. He himself is weak. He himself is a sinner. So notice here the implication that a high priest should be marked by humility. In other words, the high priest who is not being gentle with his people is not adequately fulfilling his role. If a high priest did not think of himself as a sinner like the rest of everyone else, beset with weakness, he would be prone to not deal gently with those in his care. This is what some of the Old Testament prophets would say about the priests. They were beginning to forsake their responsibility. They were not caring for their sheep. They were starving the sheep while they fed themselves. Now, we find this to be true with false religions, especially those of the works-based variety. Any religion that teaches that a man can be justified before God on the basis of his works will inevitably have leaders who lord over their members with a heavy hand. It is unavoidable. They will demand obedience and be quick to punish, not tolerate questioning or challenges. They will use shame as a weapon to manipulate their people, and often they will find ways to religiously endorse their own obvious sins at the same time that they demand absolute obedience from others. This is exactly the case with the religious leaders of Jesus' day. And he would rebuke them thoroughly in Matthew chapter 23. I'm going to read for you a few verses of that chapter. Jesus says this, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe what they tell you, but not the works they do, for they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. Jesus will later say, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus leveled this charge against the high priest, the priests, the other religious leaders of his day, the rabbis, the scribes, the Pharisees. Why? Because they refused to acknowledge some of the most basic qualifications of being a priest that he would realize, that he would acknowledge a religious leader of the people, that he himself is beset with weakness. Did you know that one of the qualifications of an elder or pastor in the New Testament is that he must not be a recent convert? Paul says this explicitly in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 
Do you know why, though, he says that the pastor or elder should not be a recent convert? Do you know why? Is it because that man might not quite have full knowledge of a lot of the things in the Bible? Is, is, his, is his doctrine not quite clarified or squared away? Has he not yet become familiar enough with the text of the Scripture that would be helpful for the sheep? Does he not yet have the ability to, to teach fully? He needs to grow in that? Perhaps, perhaps some of those. But Paul says this, he must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. The concern is conceit, is arrogance. I rose to the top so fast. I must be much holier than the rest. I must be much more righteous than the rest. I am not nearly as beset with weakness as the rest. Even in the mind of the New Testament, a a new organization following Jesus as our great high priest, a new organized under the new covenant church, humility is demanded. Romans 12.3 says, For by the grace given to me, Paul says, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned The high priest must think rightly about himself. Not only should he be human, but he needs to think rightly about what that means. I'm one of the sinners that needs atonement. I'm one of the rest. Many times in Old Testament history, this failed to be true. And certainly in Jesus' day. This has further implications for the Old Testament priests as we'll see in the next verse. Because of this, he, that high priest, is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. In the Old Testament, on the Day of Atonement, before the high priest could offer the sacrifice for the whole congregation, he was first obligated to offer a sacrifice for his own sins. Essentially, then, there were two sacrifices offered. There there are multiple animals involved in the way these sacrifices would go down. But there were two major categories. Those to consecrate the priest himself, to atone for the sins of the priest, and then to atone for the people before the ark, before the tabernacle. I want you to see this in Leviticus 16. This is where we get the establishing rules for the Day of Atonement. It says this, Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself, And shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself. Only after that was satisfied could he then offer the sins of the people. You don't go offer the sins for the people and then offer the sins for self. It's it's, it's self first. First get clean. Be, Be sinless before God. Clean before him. Guilt dealt with. Then and only then could he be seen as ready to atone for the sins of the people. Now, a quick note, because of where, where we live, I know that people uh, who hear this may have come out of an LDS background and no Mormon teaching. Regarding the Mormon view that Jesus was married and had an entire family, I say this for your benefit to hear. A lot of times Mormons are, are curious as to, why is it that Christians have such a hard time with the idea that we believe Jesus had, had a wife? They, they might say, well, there are a whole bunch of reasons in the Bible. He, he, here's just one of them. Notice. He should make atonement for himself and for his house. Notice that the high priest's offering was first to atone for the sins of his household. If Jesus was married, as Mormons claim, he would have been obligated to first offer sacrifice for the sins of his household before he could offer the sacrifice for the people. Even though he himself was sinless, his household would need to be cleansed before he could go and offer sacrifice the sacrifice, but he offered one single sacrifice because his household consisted of one sinless person. The first sacrifice was not required. There was nothing to cleanse. Over and over, we see places like this in the Bible that confirm for us why it is that we believe what we believe. Aaron would have to do a sacrifice for himself and his immediate household, who he had charge over in order to be prepared to atone for the rest of Israel. So many significant implications there for us. But he goes on. 
And no one takes this honor for himself. This is the author of Hebrews again, back in Hebrews 5. No one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, quick, take a look at this. Jesus was not merely a man who leveraged his way into history by claiming that he should be appointed a priest of God. Long before he was born on this earth, it was prophesied that he, the Son of God, would be a priest. You see, this is part of what I meant when I was telling you. The author doesn't just go, hey, just reject everything you believe in the past. Jesus is a priest. Just be, be okay with that. He goes, look, it was always supposed to be this way long before he was born on this earth, long before the incarnation. It is prophesied of Jesus. Son of God, which he's already covered already in the book of Hebrews, and that it says he will be a priest. What kind of priest? A priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek first shows up in the Bible in Genesis chapter 14. And he shows up on the scene right after Abraham returns from a battle. He wins this battle to rescue Lot and his family. And he comes out, the, the king of Sodom comes out into this, this valley, and, and Melchizedek just shows up. This guy named Melchizedek just shows up. Doesn't say anything about where he comes from. Never again we see where it tells where he goes to. But he shows up and he brings bread and wine. And he blesses Abraham. And Abraham acknowledges this guy's priesthood by tithing to him, something that these Jews will eventually do in the law for their own priests. Melchizedek there is called a priest of God Most High. Now, Abraham acknowledges him as a genuine priest. Here we see him drawn upon, looking back at Psalm 110, saying that this is the kind of priesthood that Jesus holds. Now, most of chapter 7 is going to deal with Melchizedek. We're going to come back and we're going to do that again. So we will cover... Most of that there. But what you need to know for today, Melchizedek simply appears on the scene without any intro and disappears just as quickly. We don't hear about him again for another 1,000 years of writing history until the time of David. He inserts into Psalm 110 about Melchizedek. And then again another 1,000 years before we get to the book of Hebrews, reading again. The point here is that the author is again using Old Testament references to back up his claims it was prophesied that the Messiah would be both the Son of God and a priest. And if anyone were to go, well, that's, that's a different kind of priest, different line, different thing. No, no, no. A priest after the order of Melchizedek. A forever kind of priest. And again, there will be much to talk about when we get to the details of that in chapter 7. I love that the author uses the Old Testament over and over again. He goes, Look, it's there. I'm not making this up. Look. Turn to the page. Last week we saw that this passage offers two qualifications for being a priest. It, is, it just identifies two. I gave you a bonus one today, that the priest should be humble. That's kind of implied in there. But the two that are specifically stated is that a priest must be fully human. Now, that seems really obvious, but he makes that clear. So that wrong thinking about being an angel or some other kind of creature could not satisfy the requirements here. He had to be human. Check. Second qualification is that he must be chosen by God. The word here is called by God. No one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So Aaron doesn't show up. I'm Mount Sinai and go, God, I got a great idea for you. Make me a priest, a high priest, and I'll rule in such a way. God came up with this plan. God chose Aaron. And consequently, by birthright, those who will not make any choice to it other than they are born into that line in the Old Testament, which further substantiates and enforces for us again that it's not by choice. It's not like by a person like, well, that one looks more qualified, more competent than this one. God just made the call, the one who's called. And the point of this part right here is Jesus Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him and said to him, you are my son. So Jesus, already by these two, meets these two qualifications. Fully human, already argued. Chosen by God, it's already argued. Prophesied in the Old Testament. But this passage also highlights three ways that Jesus is different, better, more qualified than the Old Testament priests. 
First, he is the son of God. He passed through the heavens. That's the second one. He didn't just pass through the earthly veil. He passed through the heavenly veil. And third, Jesus was sinless. So while the high priest would have to offer sin for himself, Jesus did not have to. He was beset with weakness. Jesus was not weak in that he fell to sin or temptation. He had no need to offer sacrifice for himself. The author has already made this clear as he closed out the last chapter. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So remember, before we get into this passage, the author's already made it clear. He's perfect, sinless, nothing lacking in him. Jesus was able to be gentle with the ignorant and the wayward, even without the weakness of falling to sin. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Jesus' whole earthly life was marked by constant prayer. But the prayer that he prayed the night before his crucifixion in the Garden of Gethsemane, that prayer was especially intense. If you read through that prayer, you'll see Jesus emoting in a kind of intensity that we don't see him emoting elsewhere. We see him crying out to his father in agony. Remember, it was then that he agonized over the imminent weight of universal sin placed upon his shoulders and more, the wrath of his father poured out on him for that sin. And why was he heard? Because of his reverence. Because of his reverence. This word reverence here means fear of God, awe. Some of, some of your English translations will use the word piety. Because of his holiness, piety, his right view of who God is. That's what reverence is. When we reverence God, it's thinking rightly about him. In fact, that's the problem with blasphemy, is that we talk about God in a way less holy than he deserves. That's the problem with using the Lord's name in vain. I don't mean anything by it. I don't mean anything by it when I, when I, when I say swears and I use the word of God. That's the problem. You don't mean anything by it. In order to reverence God rightly, we must think rightly about him. No one knew God like Jesus. He says that over and over. No one's seen the Father but me. No one knows the Father but me. Jesus is the one, the image of the invisible. He reverenced God rightly. He reverenced his Father. Psalm 22, 24. This is a famous psalm because it's the one that Jesus reminds us of when he's hanging on the cross. Some of you might remember the cross account. Jesus is hanging on the cross and one of the first things we hear him say is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, it's pointing back to Psalm 22. He's literally quoting scripture. He's quoting the beginning of Psalm 22. And later, in that exact same psalm, it says this, For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. This is a prophecy of Jesus on the cross, that while he was there, The father did not despise the son. The father did not abhor the affliction of his son, the afflicted. And he had not hidden his face from Jesus. But he heard. He heard when when Jesus cried out to him. And why? Because of his reverence. Because of his perfections. Later in this letter, we are exhorted to display the very same thing. Hebrews 12, 28 will say, with the same word that they use here for reverence, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. That we would rightly think of him. That we would acknowledge him with the worth that he is due. We are commanded to do the same in our worship. As Jesus did on the cross. As Jesus did in the garden. You can look at any part of Jesus' life and and see perfection in living in any circumstance. 
And no one dealt with more suffering and trial and struggle than Jesus. And even in that moment, he was perfect in his reverence, in his awe, in thinking rightly about his Father in heaven. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. He learned obedience through what he suffered. Now, this does not mean that Jesus had to go from disobedient to obedient, but that in order to fulfill all righteousness, he had to persist in perfect obedience all the way to the end. You get that? It's kind of like your kindergartner might pass their first test, but they've got more tests coming. You haven't graduated yet. You, you have a lot more to go in, in time. Jesus, as he continued to make his way to the cross, he did so perfectly. And when he got to the point of his earthly life, got to the cross, at that point, he was still perfect in obedience. He learned obedience through what he suffered. This is just like it says in Philippians 2.8. It says this about Jesus. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus was obedience, obedient in his death. And, and even per, more particularly, in that kind of death, torture. He was tortured to dishonor God and did not. His obedience was complete. He passed every trial as it was presented before him. And the final test of his obedience was at the cross. If Jesus had flinched even just once, we would all be eternally damned. Because he would not be the perfect, blameless sacrifice that we need. And therefore, we would need another sacrifice that was more perfect and higher in value than Jesus. Nothing like that exists. Jesus wasn't plan A, that there would be subsequent plans if it didn't work. Hebrews 5 verses 9 through 10 tells us, And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now real, real quick, just in case you're following the text, you're looking at the words, you sometimes see that the author of Hebrews uses just the word priest. He doesn't say high priest, he just says priest. He's not meaning to switch categories to you know, lower priest, higher priest. He's using that as short form. And here's a good example of how we see that. Being designated by God a high priest. He just read the passage that says that Jesus was a priest like Melchizedek. The author makes it clear he intends high priest when he says that, for those of you who are following those words. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. In this way, Jesus was made perfect. He was made complete in that there was nothing lacking in the work he was sent to accomplish. All that he was supposed to do was done. Nothing was omitted. But all of the work to the very end was completed. And that's the way perfect is used here. Perfect, is, that word is used all over the book of Hebrews with that same kind of meaning. Complete, whole, finalized, finished. Hebrews 2.10 will actually say this. We were there uh, weeks ago. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. So the Father makes the Son perfect through suffering. Not made perfect as though his death washed away his own imperfections because he doesn't have any. We already read that. But that it finished his ministry on earth. In fact, this is why on the cross, Jesus, in his final breaths, says, it is finished. Why? Because it is completed. It is perfected all the way to the end. Everything he intended to accomplish, he did. Two applications that come out of these texts for us today. The first is this. You need someone to offer a sin sacrifice on your behalf. You need someone to offer a sin sacrifice on your behalf. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, the author will later say. Your sin requires sacrifice. Not only do you need a worthy, sufficient sacrifice, but you need someone to offer it. 
And you and I are not qualified to do so. Sacrifice, quite simply, is something offered, something of value, for the sake of something else. You see, the Bible refers to the sin of humanity, all the wrongs that we commit, as exchanging the truth about God for a lie. You see how that's different than reverencing God? Truth for a lie. If we, if we think lies about God, that's the opposite of reverencing Him. It tells us that what we do in our sin is that we worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. We exchange worshiping God for worshiping His stuff. You and I have looked at God, and we looked at creation, and we said, I'd prefer this. That's our sin. That's what's taking place. We have not regarded God as most holy, as most to be desired, as our greatest treasure, our first love, our highest priority. And because of that, you and I do not have peace with God in our natural selves because of our sin. In fact, we've chosen something other than God. Why do we not have peace with God? Because we've chosen someone else. We've chosen something else. Something else looked more appealing to our eyes, deserving of more affection, more of our attention, more of our energy, more of our praise and worship even. We cannot have peace with God because of that. I want you to imagine for a second you not having peace with someone. In fact, it's probably not hard to imagine. I want you to think about someone in your life with whom you do not have perfect peace. You accidentally knocked over your neighbor's garbage can and you've been in a fight over it for the last 10 years. How how do you relate to the person with whom you have that kind of stress? How do you interact with the kind of person with whom you do not have peace? I'll tell you, very likely... This is one of the most common ways that people deal with this. We just avoid the one with whom we don't have peace. Pushing the cart down the grocery store. Oh, other aisle. See the neighbor out there that for whatever reason you've gotten an argument with and you find a quicker reason to look at the mail and get inside. You avoid going past that co-worker's desk. You, You know what I'm talking about. You're less likely to invite those family members over We all have people like that in our life. We we avoid those with whom we don't have peace. Guys, the very same is true with us and God all the time. If you don't have peace with God, and you know it in your heart, you do not have peace with God, it is incredibly natural for us to then avoid Him, to find ways around thinking about Him, focusing on Him, dwelling on Him, praying to Him, reading about Him, interacting with others regarding Him. We are not going to draw near the throne of grace when we are constantly thinking about and acknowledging our lack of peace with God. And for the record, in this case, it's only on us. In every other circumstance, we can go, well, the reason there's no peace is because of what he did, because of what she did. It's not true with God. All of the blame is placed squarely on your shoulders and mine in our relationship with God. If there's something not right, it's on us. So many times we just try to avoid him. You know, some of you are going through marriage struggles. Some of you are trying to manage wayward teens or even young adult children. Some of you are brokenhearted because of the loss of a loved one, maybe relationally or physically. Someone died. Some of you are plagued night and day because you have big life decisions to make. Which job to take? What college should I go to? Where should I live? Some of you are anxious about finding a spouse, getting married, having children. But your primary problem is not peace with those people or with those circumstances. You need something more than fixing all of those things. You need peace With God. All of this high priest language should evoke this for us. All of it should remind us that we need somebody to stand between us and God. Practically, husbands, if you don't have perfect relationship and peace with your wife, do you know what you need most? 
You need to have full peace of your heart with God. That's what she needs most from you. She needs for you to go to sleep knowing that you have peace with God. God, I'm not perfect. I'm a sinner. I'm fallen. I'm broken. I've, I've made so many mistakes. But Lord, I, 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 I yield to you. Wives, you need the same. You want to help your husband have peace with God. Start there. You want to help your kids have peace with God. There is nothing like this. There is nothing like peace with God. It is awesome. And without, without it, it's awful. It is awful. You know what the biggest difference between Christian or biblical counseling and the rest of the kind of counseling you'll find in the world? I was thinking about this this last week. I don't know what that is. The biggest difference between those kinds of counseling is both want good for you. Both want peace in relationships in life. Both are trying to solve a problem that we're seeing right in front of us there. The difference is the Christian knows we have to go first to where are you with God? Because even if somehow we can help restore the relationship between you and your wife, if you don't have peace with God, who cares? That peace won't last. A lifetime maybe, but not eternally. We meet with people and try to help pastors at this church, and just as Christians, maybe you've done this before too. We, goodness, prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. Because I promise you, when we meet together, we're going to not talk about all the issues as much. We're going to get down to, where are you with God? How are you in the Word? Do you pray to the Lord? Do you have a relationship with Him? Because if that's not squared, nothing is good. Everything's going to be alerting you to that. And that's what those things should be, a red alarms, flags to go up to say something's wrong. And it's not all these other things, it's the primary thing. You have met people, haven't you? People who are in the midst of a profound struggles. Where financial stability is precariously balancing on a razor's edge. They can barely pay the bills and have no certainty that they'll have a job next week. The Christian who has recently experienced the death of a loved one. The Christian who has just received the diagnosis, cancer. And yet, they smile. With tears... But there's a supernatural calm and contentment. How? Because if you have peace with God, you can weather all of the rest. In fact, you can consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Do not try to avoid God, but draw near to Him, to the throne of grace. And you cannot do that apart from Jesus. Jesus alone can make right our relationship with God. He alone is the source of eternal salvation. You don't get eternal life anywhere else. Jesus has cornered the market on eternal life. He has a monopoly on eternal life. There is no priest more worthy, and there is no other sufficient sacrifice. John 14, 6 says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 4, 12 says, There is no salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Paul says in 1 Timothy, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. If you have not believed in Jesus... If you have not seen him as your great high priest, the only one who stands between you and right relationship with the Father, you, are, you don't have peace naturally because of your sin, then you need to do that. You need to, you need to have peace with God. You need to make peace with God through Jesus. You need to acknowledge, I can't, I'm not allowed into the throne room. I can't go in there unless I have a high priest. We are invited in. Psalm 49, verses 7 through 9 says, Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and never see the pit. You see the problem? The psalmist here brings up the problem. He goes, listen, listen, even if you were to die for your own sins, it's not enough. It doesn't, it doesn't pay enough of the cost. You owe an eternal debt greater than that your life can pay. Even greater than that. So then what? 
In verse 15, he says, But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, death, for he will receive me. Selah. Jesus exceeds the requirements for a priest. He is not just a priest, and he is not just a high priest, but he is a great high priest who atones for our sins and offers us peace with God. Let's pray. Lord, this morning I know that there are so many circumstances in our, in our lives that, that keep us from seeing things as they really are. Lord, we often don't see ourselves as bad as we are. We oftentimes don't see Jesus as, as, as uh, drawing us into relationship with the Father. Lord, we don't always see how perfect and awe-inspiring you really are. Lord, I pray that you would correct those things for us. I pray that you'd help us to see clearly. Father, I pray that for those who are, who are seeking any other way to get into the throne room would realize there's only one way, and it's through Jesus the only way we can have peace with God. Lord, we do not take the gospel and manipulate it to be a make your life better kind of gospel. Lord, we want something so much greater and so much better than that. We want eternity with you in heaven. Lord, I pray that if there are, if there are difficulties facing my brothers and sisters here today, I pray that you would use those things to be red flags and alarms and point us back to our need for peace with you through Jesus. Lord, let peace with you through your Son be something that we see as an everyday entering the throne of God. Not just a one-time past event that took place when we were converted. But Lord, let it, let it be something that impresses upon us that tomorrow morning when we wake up, that we would prioritize our day. And see that no matter what difficulties we're going to face, we first need to be reminded by and feel the graciousness and the mercy that we receive when we enter into the throne room through Jesus. Father, help that to be every day this week. Help us to be reminded by our need to do that. Help us to never think for a moment that we just do it apart from Jesus. Help us to see that it is only by him. And Lord, help it produce worship in our hearts and on our lips when we realize all over again that it is only through your son and his sacrifice on a cross that we may have peace with you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.